So now we'll shift gears and, and talk about what kind of traits potato breeders consider when they're developing new potato varieties. This slide shows a whole bunch of traits that I won't elaborate on now because the next few slides show photographs of a lot of these and I elaborate on them more then. Um, I'll just point out two things when looking at a long list of traits in potato. First of all, I've divided these traits into quality traits, um, disease resistance traits, and, and, and general traits, and would say that in developed nations like the US, the emphasis in breeding tends to be on quality traits, and, and not so much for disease resistance, because we typically have chemicals that can control um, a lot of the diseases. In developing nations, the cost of pesticides or the availability of pesticides uh, isn't very good. Um, and so the emphasis shifts towards disease resistance relative to the other traits. The other thing that I'll mention um, in the slides, uh, still on the screen, is that, and, and something I'll elaborate on later, is that potato breeding is essentially the art of balancing these and a whole bunch of more other traits all at the same time. So high starch content is something that's important for both French fry and chipping potatoes. Um, it's an essential attribute for both of those market classes. Uh, and it's important because potatoes need to have um, high starch for processing um, because the higher the starch, the less oil that's absorbed during frying. Oil, in addition to not being so healthy, is also quite expensive. Breeding programs don't typically measure starch directly, but measure starch content indirectly by measuring um, tuber density. So in, in the picture here is the method that my breeding program still uses, um, which we put eight pounds of potatoes in a basket, attach it to a, a hydrometer, and then um, um, let it go and see how deep the scale sinks into the water. The deeper it sinks, the higher the starch content. Another way of doing this is um, to take an arbitrary amount of potatoes and weigh it in air and weigh it in water and calculate density and thus starch content that way. Another really important attribute in processing potatoes, both chip and french fry, um, is fry color. So consumers, for the most part, prefer potatoes after they're fried to be relatively light um, in color for both potato chips and french fries. Dark brown chips and fries also have somewhat of a bitter taste in addition to not looking so appealing. The compounds that are primarily responsible for the brown color are glucose and fructose. So if a potato has a high amount of those sugars, um, it will turn bri brown during frying. It's, it's just simply a, a Maillard reaction. The, the issue arises when you want to store potatoes in the cold. So potatoes that you harvest in September and want to store all the way through April and make potato chips and french fries along the way. It's that potatoes, when they're stored in the cold, um, tend to accumulate glucose and fructose. And so for the past few decades, there have been intensive efforts in my breeding program as well as just about every other um, developed nation breeding program to develop potatoes that accumulate less glucose and fructose um, when they're stored in the cold compared to potatoes that um, were developed prior to several decades ago. Shallow eyes tend to be uh, an important attribute for all market classes, um, primarily because it's just a pain to peel potatoes where the eyes are deep. Um, the eyes on this potato, um, Ozette, uh, aren't particularly deep, but it would, you could imagine it would be a nuisance to, to peel. For processing, um, the deeper the eyes, the deeper you have to peel to eliminate them, and of course, thus the waste, wastage in, in your home kitchen. No one wants to spend a lot of time carving around eyes. So selection against deep eyes is something that's common to all potato breeding programs. Uh, hundreds or thousands of years ago, deep eyes was actually a beneficial trait in potato because it helped to protect young sprouts um, from breaking off before tubers could be planted. So uh, I've already made the comment before that in many ways chip potatoes and um, french fry potatoes share a lot in common. The primary difference is, is shape. So in common, um, potatoes that are developed for these markets have to have high starch and accumulate low sugars in the cold. Um, 
the ideal shape for a french fry potato, not that you can achieve it, would be a brick because then you would get the maximum yield of french fries um, for a given, a given volume. The ideal shape for a chip potato would be a baseball. Round chips um, work better in automated, automated slicing and packing operations and a, a round potato allows you to uh, maximize the inner volume to well, minimize the amount of wastage due to peeling. And so you get more product per um, pound of input potatoes. For for fresh market uh, potatoes, there's considerable emphasis on tuber appearance, um, where tuber appearance is really a composite of how smooth the skin is or how even the russeting is. If it's a russet potato you're trying to develop, how shallow the eyes are, how attractive the color uh, and shape are. Uh, I often like to say that the top three traits in developing fresh market potatoes are looks, looks, and looks. Uh, it's kind of appalling in some ways, but the reality is that um, most of us buy vegetables based on appearance, and uh, that includes buying fresh potatoes. And so uh, in order for a new potato, a fresh potato variety to have any chance in the marketplace, it has to look pretty, in addition to having any other attributes you'd like it to have. Another trait that's important in developing fresh market potatoes is to ensure that they don't disintegrate extensively after boiling or turn gray. So every year we boil dozens of potatoes that we're considering for release as fresh market clones to see um, whether or not they fall apart. And in this picture you can see a few potatoes like this one where my cursor is that have disintegrated upon boiling. That's okay for a chipping potato but it's not kosher for a fresh market potato. And I don't have any really good examples in this photo of how gray potatoes can turn after boiling, but those that turn considerably gray after boiling, um, we also just discard from consideration. Diseases, of course, impact um, plant breeding no matter what plant you're working with. In potato, the big three diseases worldwide, in my estimation, are late blight viruses and cyst nematodes, which I'll discuss briefly here. Um, th this photograph shows um, a potato field, uh, I think it was perhaps about two weeks after late blight had moved in. It's just a close up of some vines on the ground and you can see that, no surprise, late blight completely wipes out potato and it does so in a very short time frame. From a breeding perspective, there have been a lot of R genes that have been introgressed into potato over the years. Um, this was particularly prevalent activity uh, in the mid-1900s or so, but it turns out that every one of the R genes that has been introgressed into potato um, uh, eventually, and for that matter, typically quickly um, broke down, um, and so its, it's use usefulness was, was lost. A at the moment, the only good options for controlling late blight are either to spray chemicals regularly, which we do in, in the U.S., or to try to work with polygenic um, resistance, which doesn't break down so easily, but does reduce the degrees of freedom you have for uh, incorporating other traits um, into the final cultivar. Potato viruses, viruses are a, a pernicious pest um, worldwide. Potato virus Y and potato leaf roll are both um, transmitted by insect vectors and can uh, easily spread. If you have infection of a potato plant during the season that it's being grown, the yield reduction isn't so great. The problem really arises in what happens when you plant an infected tuber the following year. And that's sort of illustrated here in a, in a trial I once observed where um, obviously the potatoes in the center of this picture were heavily infested with the virus and the, the yield wasn't going to be um, particularly good at all compared to some of the potatoes you see at the margins where the virus levels weren't so high. The good news from a breeding standpoint at least is that there is a single dominant gene, the RY gene, that um, has proven very effective against PVY. It doesn't seem to have broken down yet. So we can control PVY if we have to, if you um, include the RY gene uh, in your breeding efforts. Globally, cyst nematodes are also a really serious problem in potatoes. Um, they, 
issue being that when they're present and allowed to build up to high enough levels, they dramatically reduce yield 80, 90 percent or more. In this picture um, are some cysts of the, the golden cyst nematode, which is um, found in New York State. These cysts actually represent the female, um, the bodies of the, the female nematode, and when the female dies, um, it leaves behind a cyst with several hundred eggs in it. One of the really nasty aspects of cyst nematodes is that um, they can survive in the soil for 30 or more years. So once you get them, they're almost impossible to um, eliminate. In the U.S., we have the golden cyst nematode in New York and a close relative, the pale cyst nematode uh, in Idaho. Um, and there are considerable efforts um, to contain the spread of both of these. In New York, the, one of the ways that we've kept the, um, the golden nematode from spreading for the past 50 years is to develop a lot of golden cyst nematode resistant varieties. If you have this pest in your land, you're required to grow um, um, resistant varieties as part of a rotation to keep the levels down and to keep it from spreading further. And indeed in New York, cyst nematode has pretty much not spread um, meaningfully in the past 50 plus years. Another attribute or disease, I should say, that, that concerns me um, in New York and is also of concern in many other breeding programs is common scab, which is caused by a prokaryotic organism, Streptomyces scabies, where the real issue arises when um, a potato is so susceptible that it reacts to common scab by forming deep pits. The deep pits um, make the potatoes pretty much unmarketable uh, as fresh market produce and from a processing standpoint requires so much peeling to remove them that um, they're not worth using for processing either. So in my program and I expect any other program that worries about common scab, we eliminate clones which um, are prone to pitting and of course prefer clones which don't react at all um, but uh, are willing to tolerate um, clones where there is just some surface scab that can be easily peeled off if the potato is destined for processing. There are very few chemical control options for common scab. You can spend a few hundred bucks an acre fumigating with tear gas. Uh, but other than that, I don't know that anything else can be done. So the, the best means to control it remains um, resistance. One of the interesting things in potato um, compared to other crops is that yield really hasn't changed that much over 100 plus years of potato breeding. So the cultivars that were developed 100 years ago, the best yielding ones, yield pretty much the same as the best yielding cultivars today. Um, I've often e experienced a reaction from grad students and breeders of other crops of sort of disbelief that this could be the case in potato, wondering how it is we could spend so much time breeding and not improving yield. Um, I guess my answer to that pretty much amounts to um, calories per acre that potato produces still dramatically um, outstrips that of wheat, rice, and maize. So uh, it's not us who has the problem with yield um, to date. Um, in any case, potato clearly yields well enough that um, we can focus our uh, attention on other, uh, on other attributes. And so in practice, what it amounts to in a potato breeding program is that we are um, aiming to develop new cultivars which yield comparable to existing cultivars. Uh, in my own program, if it doesn't yield, uh, a candidate cultivar doesn't yield 90% of the, the variety Atlantic, which is a common Czech variety, we'll discard it. But 90% are better, and, and we'll keep considering it. Uh, there are a couple of physical defects that we're constantly selecting against when we're conducting potato breeding. Um, one's pictured on the left here, which actually shows two symptoms together, and that's potatoes that have a propensity to develop hollow heart and potatoes that have a propensity to develop brown centers or the brown center doesn't become hollow. Clearly either one is not particularly desirable, not the kind of thing you want to find when you cut open a potato at home. Um, another um, common defect that varieties differ for in terms of susceptibility are growth cracks, which are pictured on the right. Growth cracks typically occur when a potato has been subjected to a bit of drought stress and then suddenly gets a, a lot of water. The tuber expands rapidly. Some cultivars um, crack much more readily under these conditions than others, and we select against those whenever we see it. Uh, 
another thing that um, I'm constantly battling with in my own program um, is acceptable maturity. So we'd like the vines to die um, by the time the growing season is done or die a little bit um, before that. Or if they, because if they don't, um, tubers will cling to immature vines, which makes mechanical harvest or hand harvest difficult, if not um, impossible. So um, I, I mentioned before, and this is sort of connected to the topic of um, uh, adaptation to, to long days. The, um, whenever you make a cross with a wild species, you'll find that they um, mature very late. Uh, and you have to fight, fight this battle of bringing your material back to acceptable, acceptable maturity. This picture is one that reminds me of an experience I had very early uh, as a breeder at Cornell. I, I requested some potatoes from Idaho for making crosses, and my predecessor said, well, the growing seasons out there is much longer than in New York. You're going to get some really late vines. It's going to cause you problems. Um, I ignored and made the crosses anyway, and this is actually the field where you see that my predecessor was right. Um, you, you see a lot of green vines here at the time we dug the potatoes, and this made harvest a pain. Anything where you still see green vines at harvest time would pretty much eliminate. Okay, moving on to um, the third part, um, sort of how we consider all these traits simultaneously in, in, in potato breeding.